All right, uh, are we ready for everyone? Our next presenters are Michelle Klinger, Senior Security Consultant for Visible Risk. She has over 10 years of IT experience, including systems analysis and integration with emphasis in security and WAN technologies. Security experience includes review and creation of security policies, performing security assessments, penetration testing, and security process improvement. She's also the president of the Dallas NASIC chapter, co-founder of B-Sides Texas, and coordinates the National DFW Security B-Sides Information Security Conference. With her is Martin Fisher, he's the Director of Information Security for a large Atlanta area healthcare system. Ten points if you guess which one that is. Uh, Martin, <laughs> Martin has over 20 years of experience in the information technology space, with the last seven years focused on information security. In a previous life, he went through two successful, very successful PCI assessments with a level one merchant. He's active in the Atlanta ASIC chapter, is part of the B-Sides Atlanta Coordinating Committee, and hosts a little podcast that talks about InfoSec at www.southernfriedsecurity.com. And I'll let you go with me. Thank you. Thank you. No, stop it. Stop it. Okay. <laughs> so who are we? Oh, uh, well, he kind of stole the thunder. Uh, everything that he said is pretty much um, what I'm going to say now. Um, my name is Michelle Klinger. I've been in IT for over 10 years, about six years forming information security assessments, uh, one of which was doing Q, uh, being a PCI QSA. I currently work for Visible Risk, performing network analysis and security operations center services. Uh, I'm Mark Fisher, I'm a Chief Information Security Officer um, for Healthcare Provider. Um, I'm working for financial services, but I spend most of my time at a, uh, at, at my exit agreements, as I have to describe it this way a major airline based in Atlanta. And um, that was where we did two rounds of, of uh, QSA work. Uh, with, um, actually, two different QSA firms as a level one merchant to get ourselves uh, a, a, a successful uh, report of compliance. If you ever listen to my podcast, I'm a big believer in pragmatic security. And as a security leader, I think that you, you, it's, it's incumbent upon us, because you're, if you're a level one merchant, if you're a service uh, provider, you go to QSA from coming, you're spending a metric or load of money uh, to have that done. You need to get the maximum amount of value out of that spend that you can get. And setting up an adversarial relationship with your QSA guarantees that you will get the minimal possible return on your investment. All right, so that leads into what's what's this talk all about? Um, so we're not here to rehash uh, the argument of whether PCI is good or bad. Uh, been there, done it quite frankly, sick and tired of it. Um, we're here to discuss how to make what can be considered a painful process less painful and hopefully more beneficial. Most importantly, what can the QSA do uh, to help improve and make your security program stronger? Believe it or not, there are actually QSAs out there that are security professionals. Um, <laughs> I like to consider myself one of them. Um, and who are able to do more than just check a box and write a report. From the QSA's or previous QSA's perspective, we'll discuss what organizations can do to make the PCI assessment go more smoothly and to get more value from your QSA. From the CISO side of the house, we're going to look talk about how you, you need to get your, your report on compliance effectively. Because let's face it, at the end of the day with, uh, with a um, QSA, it's like the rock is the end product. But if that's all you're there for, you're doing it wrong. So we're going to show you how you can actually not just get the rock most efficiently, most effectively, with the least amount of sturm and drum, but also leverage everything that happens up to and including getting that rock to improve your security program. So the truth is one of the things in infosec compliance we talk about all the time, right? You, the, the truth is out there somewhere. And we want to know the truth about our security posture. The problem is um, we don't know. We don't necessarily know the truth of what our employees are doing. We don't necessarily know the truth of what bad actors are trying to do us. And when outsiders, the scare quotes, come in, um, we act badly. We really do. Um, either if it's external audit, internal audit, QSAs, um, whoever it is, when they come in, we immediately go into bunker mode. And we, we don't look at that opportunity to get truth, or at least a different perspective on what's happening in our environment as something that can be valuable. We look at it as a threat. And that's just no. 
not the way it should go. So at the end of the day, uh, how many of you guys have ever been through a PCI assessment? Honest to God, QSA came in and we checked that out. Yeah. All right. What you think you know about PCI assessments is quite probably completely, totally, absolutely wrong. Um, there, there actually are no virgin sacrifices performed unless you're using one particular QSA that we'll talk about. Later. <laughs> Off the record. So before okay. the assessment. So that's me. So before the assessment, what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the about four four steps in the in the assessment process before the assessment. Back was the three. Before the assessment, during the assessment, and after the assessment. And we're going to go from a QSA and a CISO perspective. So before the assessment, from a QSA's perspective. Um, what's the QSA going to be looking for? Uh, initially, establish a rapport. Um, we, the QSA is going to want to meet with stakeholders and team members to find out exactly what they're looking to get out of the assessment. Um, I've been told by clients before that um, they're trying to push through security projects. Now, I think for those of you that have read or gone through the PCI assessment, the requirements are, can almost sometimes be categorized as security 101 basics. Um, but some of these organizations can't even get Security 101 uh, projects off the ground, implemented. Um, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to find out what's their intent with this, uh, with this assessment. Sometimes they're using it to push through implementing security policies or, or you know, implementing an, information, uh, an incident response plan. Um, so figuring out what, so the QSA wants to figure out what it is you're looking to get out of the assessment. Um, and with that, at times, even implement security measures that go above and beyond. And they're using and they're looking to use this rock to push those through. The next item is, uh, again, before the assessment, document prepared preparedness. Um, I can't tell you how important it is. The difference between a shitty assessment and one that things get accomplished can almost be suboptimal assessment. So <laughs> can be determined based on document preparation. Um, how the QSA validates requirements is not a secret. There is a document out there that actually tells you what the QSA will be looking for, what they will be asking for. Take a look at that document. Look at it before they show up. You can look at that document and figure out, okay, here's the things they're gonna be asking for. How's about I gather that information ahead of time and potentially even send it to the QSA before they come on site. They can do a lot of things remotely, but you know, document review, that kind of thing. So that's a, that's a something that is, is highly recommended when dealing with your QSAs. Um, when putting together these documents, some things to keep in mind is believability. A QSA wants to get the warm and fuzzy feeling that the documentation that you're providing actually reflects what's happening. So if you could provide dates on some of those screenshots or configuration files, um, that is most helpful, as well as being able to say, okay, Here's a list of my documentation. Here are the requirements each document is looking to satisfy. There's nothing more painful for a QSA, not that anyone cares about the pain of the QSA, but it's important um, to kind of make their life a little easier. Um, trying to figure out, here's a ton metric uh, list of documentation, now go figure out what it is I was trying to uh, satisfy with that. So, Pairing up or, or matching up this document goes with this requirement is very helpful because it actually will minimize the amount of time the QSA, the assessment will take, how long they're on site, um, and that's very helpful for everyone. As well as if they have to go back to you and I'll ask you what was this document, where did this go to, what was this for, then again, you're just wasting time. Uh, next item would be... No, I don't. Uh, yeah, one more. Identify appropriate resources. Uh, any any QSA worth his salt, um, and if they don't, something to, to request is what's the agenda? What is it that we're going to be discussing? What are the various topics? And from there, you can then the organization can figure out uh, interview times. Here are the list of pe here are the topics. Here are the, identify the people who who can speak to those topics, and then start creating uh, meeting invites. Um, this will save a lot of time from, I've, got, I've, I've had both uh, uh, ex 
experience as well. I'll be on site and they'll just figure out right then and there um, who, who can speak to what. Or they can take the time ahead of time and figure out who it is I need to speak to. And we want, and we want to make sure we identify the people who can speak in depth, not just high level or piecemeal. And if it is piecemeal, then put those people in the same room so they can speak to it from a complete picture as opposed to let's discuss one thing, you know, then we have another interview five hours later to continue that rest of that conversation. The QSA has acknowledged that this is going to be cutting in to time, right, where real work is done. Um, so getting this planned out ahead of time should minimize the impact uh, on people's day-to-day -day activities. So as a CISO, it's a really, um, you gotta walk a very fine line. Even before the QSA begins what they're doing, you need to decide who your QSA is gonna be. The fine line is you have to remember the QSA is, is working for you, you're paying for them, but they're not working for you. They're actually working for the card brands and for the acquiring bank. It's kinda like external audit. So when you are interviewing the QSA firms, you need to make sure you are interviewing the person who's actually going to be on site visiting you. Do not let them play the fantastic A-team QSA person you interviewed. Then the schlump who just came out of school is the, is the guy who shows up who has the social skills of, you know, a, a, a brick, right? That just doesn't work well. So and don't be afraid to fire a QSA. I've done it once. The acquiring bank, once we explained to them why we were firing our QSA, um, and there was a legitimate reason for it, they were okay with it. We got an extension on getting our rock done. That's really a last ditch thing. You need to work with the QSAs on site and their leadership team. And for God's sake, don't do what I know peer of mine did. Don't pay the QSA up front. Ever. Ever pay the QSA up front. Additionally, one of the really key things, and this, this should not have to be said, what it does is you need to be honest with the QSA. The minute a QSA thinks that you are trying to hide something, their spidey sense goes off and they are going to be on you like white on rice. They are. It's ugly. It's ugly. Now, this doesn't mean you spill your guts. Like, when I was at 12, I was at <laughs> summer camp. No, don't do that. But when you're asked a direct question, or if you have something that is directly responsive to what's going on, don't hide it, don't overspin it, and, and just take your lumps, right? You should, let's be honest, if you don't know what your rock is going to look like at the end, you're an idiot anyway, and I'm not helping. Also, don't be a jerk during your QSA. Um, this is about relationships. If you have a really pissed off QSA, um, they are going to find, they're going to make it their job to find that one thing that you can't remediate between then and the issuance of the rock. They will, right? Because you went out of your way to piss them off. Don't let them roll over you, but don't piss them off either. So I just wanted to go back to Martin's point about uh, interviewing your QSAs. Um, I tell a personal story at this one. So when I was doing a QSA, the majority, I would say five years of my doing QSA work, I did uh, service providers. I really maybe one merchant. Uh, so I went to a new firm. They only did merchants. So I was uh, being interviewed by a client, uh, potential client to do uh, an assessment, uh, a merchant assessment. Um, and I didn't think it was really a big deal. Maybe some physical security differences. What, what's the big deal? The client also they interviewed me. I I, I know my I knew my QSA stuff, um, but they also were like, well, it shouldn't be a big deal. Well, I completely destroyed that. Uh, assessment and because of the because I didn't know merchants as, as well as I should have uh, we lost the client um, a big client so I just want to stress um, understanding and getting a QSA that knows their stuff is important but keep in mind it's very unreasonable for one to think that a QSA knows every technology out there and everything about your environment they're not going to know everything or even how, the, how you would make money right so Get so when you interview, make sure they understand they may have some experience in your industry um, and some of the technologies that you may have, but don't think that they should come in and know every know, know every operating system that there is and every application that there is. It's just not possible. So. During the assessment, any questions so far? Okay. 
during the assessment. <clears throat> okay, so what is the QSA going to be looking for? Um, any attempt to mislead. I hesitate to use the word hot, lied, or hide, uh, or hide things. Um, I want to say we're looking for inconsistencies. Um, during interviews with various team members, from, um, a QSA should be interviewing various team members, um, you know, from networking, uh, HR, that kind of thing. And sometimes they will ask repetitive questions. Um, this is done both to confirm that what they've already been told they understood correctly, um, as well as to let the, the, the person that they're interviewing give them a sense of, All right, I've, I've been given some of the background, I understand. And they're also looking to see if the answers differ. Again, not looking to, doesn't necessarily mean they're, uh, the people are lying. Um, on the contrary, what I've often found is that the inconsistencies arise because people that speak to the process and procedures are speaking to what they think should be going on versus what's actually going on. And that's very common. So here's the policy and this is what we should be doing. And then you speak to the actual people that do it and they're like, yeah, no, we do something completely different. Again, not lying, it's just there's a, there's a perception difference. Uh, meeting ditchers. <laughs> um, there's nothing worse than being stood up by a client. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been stood up for interviews. <coughs> and it, it's actually to be expected. The majority of the time that I've been on site, there's always a fire. There's always something that goes down um, when it's my turn to interview like the networking team. So it's understood that there will be meeting. Uh, people just don't show up or they'll cancel at the last minute. But something to keep in mind if this does happen, if you cancel the meeting, have a follow-up date and time ready. Um, it just wastes time for the QSA to have to now hunt you down to create a new schedule and a new, a new meeting invite. And again, when we talk about wasting the QSA's time and making it harder for them, I know we have no sympathy for them, but the intent there is if, if we make it easier for them, then the assessment goes more smoother and, it, and they get out of your hair a lot quicker and the amount of time they're on site um, uh, minimizes and you save budget that way. So there's, there's all types of reasons why that's, why that's a good idea. Uh, a well of information. So when on site, a lot of times when I'm interviewing people, there's typically two to three people that know just about everything. Um, so let's so schedule the meetings with those two to three people. Um, I understand that it's a time suck for those people, um, but being a, being able to interview a limited amount of people in the quickest amount of time again gets them out of your hair, gets everyone back into the day to day uh, uh, activities. So being able to provide the QSA with the most knowledgeable resources will help it again go much quicker. Uh, this is a good one. Managerial support. Key executive managerial support. I had one assessment uh, that I did that the, uh, the CISO walked in and said, listen guys, we're having a PCI assessment. Be honest. Let them know what is and is not in place from a PCI perspective, right? Don't, don't spill the beans on other stuff they're not here to look at. But be honest. We want to know what's not in place now as opposed to later. The CISO's goal was to ensure that the rock was completed accurately. The CISO does not want anything biting them in the ass later um, and wasting time if they could, and remediation if, if everyone is honest up front, we know what to expect, and then we can move forward from there. Right, as the CISO, the, for God's sake, don't try to strong arm the, the QSA. Um, I've seen people try to do this where the QSA will start asking questions about in scope infrastructure. You, we don't need to discuss that. That's out of scope. Well, the QSA actually has to decide what's out of scope. Uh, and trying to strong arm them, especially if you go above, you jump above their head to their manager to complain about them, and it's not a legitimate complaint. Um, yeah, you're, you're being a little bit of a D bag there, and you're gonna pay for it. Also, for God's sake, don't let the QSA run roughshod over you. There are some real Type A personalities out there as QSAs. Me. <laughs> and um, they will sometimes just start going down rabbit holes or they'll start assessing infrastructure which is clearly out of scope. When I was at the airline we had a QSA who was on the ground with us for about four and a half days and they kept wanting to talk about the way the, um, the underwing weight balance system worked. It had nothing to do with credit cards. Zero, not, not even connected to the card holder. After, after our 
hours, I'll explain it to you. No, this isn't still. No, no, it's not. And they end up having to leave our account. So it's again, it's a fine line between strong arming them and making sure they stay focused on what it is they're supposed to be doing. And again, it's all about honesty, right? And you need to tell your folks, and you need to demonstrate that being honest, brave and honest, is the only way to deal with the QSA. Because if they're going to lie to the QSA, they're going to lie to you. All right, just to put your skin on the game. So just don't do that. Well, we're just running through the time. <laughs> So after the assessment. After, oh, and then after, okay. So after the assessment, wrap up with high level findings. Prior to, so the, any questions so far? Just, okay. So prior to, so the QSA is on site, everything's said and done, they're about to leave. Prior to them leaving on site, you should get them, sit them down, have a, a wrap up meeting, and get them to tell you the high, the, the high level synopsis of the big ticket items that aren't in place. Um, this better prepares management and gives them an idea of what the current state of compliance is um, so that they can start planning what remediation may look like or, or start planning schedules and, 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 and timelines. Do not let the, the, the QSA leave without getting this compliance pulse. Um, and if there are discrepancies in what's stated right then and there, um, those should be identified right away. If there's any, if QSA says this is not in place and you're like, no, it is. That's something that should be identified right then and there, and something to be followed up with, you know, immediately. Timely delivery of outstanding items. So, more than likely, the QSA will have left without everything that they need. <coughs> and this can happen for a majority of reasons. Sometimes the QSA asks for documentation, screenshots, configuration files. Um, the client will say, yeah, we'll get those for you, um, and they just never come because, you know, flurry of activity. Um, and sometimes the QSA just plain forgets to, to ask questions, to ask certain questions. You just didn't get to it, run out of time. So this will lead to follow-up questions, tons of follow-up questions. Um, and they're going to be asking for documentation, hey, let's get on a call, let's, let's answer these questions. You want to be able to deliver those <coughs> those outstanding items as quick as possible. You shouldn't let several weeks go by um, after you know asking for the firewall rules. It shouldn't take five weeks to get the firewall rules. Um, and what's the purpose? Um, or what's, why is there such an urgency? Well, you have to remember the QSA not only has to review those documents, but then has to determine if they're, if, if they're you know, satisfy the requirement. And they may have follow-up questions, and they may ask for more documentation. So, I don't know if you're seeing the pattern, but now you start to expand the assessment even further and again, more billable time and, 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 and money. So provide the documentation um, as soon as you can. Uh, don't let it uh, flounder. Okay. Oh, more importantly, uh, once the, I don't know if you guys know this, but once a QSA is off site, they give us about a week, depending on their firm, they give you about a week to write the rock. And then you're off to the next assessment. So the longer that you take to give them the documentation, nine times out of 10, they'll be on another assessment and they're not gonna be able to spend the time that they need to um, looking at your documentation. So it just becomes a domino effect. And don't use that as a strategy, y'all. You will pay, you will pay high price for doing that. Question? I, I have a comment about that. Give Please. it to me. Um, I do, I'm new to QSA, but, but you are I, one. I, I'm sorry? You are one. I am one, yes. Um, I know, he's smiling a lot. <laughs> well, no, I mean, you're, you're hitting on a lot of things that, that, that I deal with from that perspective. And one of the main points I try to deliver to the customer, hey, this is my opinion. This is my opinion of the assessment. So if you don't, so if you disagree with it, argue. Number two, yeah, we're about that, so. if you don't give me something, it's a fine. Well, yeah. if, I, if I try and try and try to get something from you, I'm not going to, after a certain point, after, after my deadlines are met, I'm going to write it as a finding, and then you're going to have to deal with your Adjust. require. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not trying. I don't. I don't, I don't take an adversarial approach to that. But I'm very clear about that. In that, look, you need to give all this information while in here, or or a reasonable time afterwards. Or as long as your yeah. client's got that, you've made that expectation clear. I think that's reasonable. Sure. But there are times when all of a sudden you've been dealing with a, a really nice, warm, fuzzy QSA, and they go off site. And they have a personality transplant and they have like four handwriting constantly. 
sure, sure. Just don't be that. Yeah. No, 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 no. Just get busy. I, find, I missed like the very first minute or two. So what's yeah. the ROC? What's the oh. report on compliance? That's what I thought. That's, that's the deliverable from the QSA. Yeah, sorry, I was throwing at you. <laughs> I was just nodding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where am I? Findings discussion. Okay, so the QSA was on site. Follow up questions are, are given. They're doing their crunching or whatever it is they do in the back room under the basement. Um, and at some point, they should be able, after a couple weeks, two to three weeks, they should be able to give you here's where we are as of right now. I've gone through everything that I've either been given or I've reviewed on site. Here's the documentation of everything. Um, what I like to do is, I, 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 what I used to like to do was create a spreadsheet that lists just the items that aren't in place. Because you know what's in place already, just what's not in place in a spreadsheet format. I found that clients uh, tend to like this so they can sort, see where things are, they can use that spreadsheet to track their remediation. So something to potentially ask for um, as you go through your, your, through your assessment. Um, now, after they give this to you, the QSA is now relying on you guys or the organization, excuse me, the client, to review it, make sure that it's accurate. Um, there may be things in there that may be, may be wrong, uh, just because it was it was understood incorrectly, uh, it was documented wrong for some reason, and sometimes assumptions are made. Um, so it's up to the QS, uh, excuse me, it's up to the client to take it upon themselves to look at that document and what's not in place and make sure that it's accurate. And if a conversation needs to be had, then that's the time it needs to be done. Why, why did you think it wasn't in place and we think it's in place? And if a, if a reevaluation of the, of the intent of the control is required, then that's what needs to occur. And your QSA should be willing to do that. Like you said, if, if, you don't, if we disagree, let's discuss it. And maintenance of communication. Um, so now that you have this, now that the client has this spreadsheet, it's up to them to take it, evaluate it, and now they're off to the races with remediation. Um, some items on the spreadsheet may be low-hanging fruit, and you probably can get those out of the way real quick, and then submit the documentation to the QSA to validate, and then mark things, you know, in place, and then move them off of the list. But then there are times that there are things that are going to take uh, a couple months to do. Uh, what you don't want to do is you don't want to just lose all communication with your QSA uh, for those amount of months that it takes for you to remediate. You want to maintain uh, communication with the with the with the QSA. You want to brief them periodically of where you're at with remediation and and to let them know, hey. Um, you may be receiving some documentation that may be coming down the pipeline for remediation that we've done. So be, expect some documentation to come in. This allows the QSA to, well, one, it gives them a heads up. Um, again, they might be on site with another client, so they may have to uh, you know, look at their schedule, readjust it so they can have time to review the documentation, as well as some remediation validation um, may require a WebEx or even a conference call or maybe a, a revisit. So keeping the, the lines of communication open, letting them know, letting a QSA know where you're at, what to expect, is very helpful. The key thing with the CISO is this is where you, you, are, you have the potential to execute a career limiting maneuver. Right? Um, you need to know what the rock is going to say right now um, to within like a 95% confidence level. And you need to start communicating that out because here's the thing, and some of y'all may not know this, for publicly traded companies, and for example, I'm not a publicly traded company where I'm at now, but as a quasi public, we have some quasi public agencies inside of our organization, we're required to provide the report on compliance to our audit committee. In my case is the board of trustees and a public company to be a board of directors. That is a pretty heavy stuff. The C-suite gets really interested um, once stuff is going to the audit committee. This is where CFOs, chief compliance officers, COOs, CEOs start getting really nervous if there are some nasty findings. So let's say that you've walked in and they, you've discovered a major issue. Before that report on compliance starts making its way to you, you need to start communicating internally that there's going to be problems. If it's severe enough, you know, there's going to be consequences potentially for you. 
big bucks. The the key is you've got you've got to know what that rock is going to say, and you've got to start communicating it up. You've got to keep your commitments because a lot of times if you know your rock's not going to be great, the the natural instinct is to want to avoid the problem. So you kind of take this QSA off your speed dial and start blocking their calls. <laughs> Don't do that. It just makes it worse. It just, it just makes it worse. But the most important thing, and this is something that I've seen a couple of folks screw up pretty badly, is they think that the rock's not negotiable. That it's sort of like, you know, I turned in my stuff to my fourth grade science teacher and I got a score back. And that's what I go tell my parents about. Isn't it so? You can, you know, like Michelle was talking about the findings discussion. If the QSA says, hey, this is not it, this is not in compliance, and you believe it is, you need to have a conversation. It's negotiable, which means you need to know the PCI DSS as well as the QSA. Plus, know your own stuff well enough to talk about compensating controls and why what you think is accurate. But also remember, the negotiation with the rock is in pixie dust. If you suck, you suck. And you, you, if, you, if, you are, if you've got unencrypted credit card data around the place, and QSA found out about it, you can't change that reality. I've been in a conversation where a um, person in the business was trying to convince the QSA not to report on a pretty significant finding. And it's an awkward, ugly, humiliating conversation. I mean, you've got to come up as well. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> usually when I did assessments, regardless of whether they were QSA, uh, PCI, or, or regular security assessments, one of the things I always did was after the end, um, I would always say, so during the wrap-up, was there anything that was surprising? Was there anything that I found that just shocked the hell out of you? Um, and if there were uh, you know, a majority of items that were shocking, that does not bode well for you, your team or your, your security program. Um, or your career. <laughs> or your career. Um, so that's one of the things I, 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 I try to do at the end is, is see, get a gauge on how well they do their environment. Yay. So the rock gets delivered. So the QSA, they're done. Bye-bye. Yes, it's about you know, <laughs> drinks with, with uh, umbrellas in it and a, and a pool boy named you know, Pablo. Several pool boys. <laughs> and if you're a CISO, your job is actually just now starting because you know, you've got this rock now that you've sort of been pre-communicating what's going to be in it, but there's always details you weren't aware of in it. There's, you know, you know the way it's worded, there are people you didn't expect were on the distribution list, and now you've got all these explanations. The biggest thing you have to do, especially because um, a lot of this stuff is technology-based, and unless you work for a technology company, or even if you do work for a technology company, a lot of times the people who are consuming this document are not technologists. They need context. You can read a rock, which is really not that bad, and your CFO could think the world's about to implode. Right? Because they're thinking, oh my gosh, the Mario Bank is going to have 50 basis points, we're going to ask for one. Yeah. All right, now, in the, now we're talking about material restatement of financial reporting. Yeah. Servants Oxley stuff kicking in. Yeah. Context. Context is king. Then you've got to be able to very, very cogently, very precisely tell the story to the organization about where we go from here. Um, every QSA engagement I've ever seen, there is some remediation work. If you're lucky, it's minor stuff. You know, fix this policy, change that procedure, whatever, change the locks on the data center or whatever it is, right? It's bigger than that, you've got to start being able to tell people, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to get there, here's what the vision looks like, all right? But also, you need to just double, triple, quadruple check the rock for accuracy. Now, let's say you have a really bad engagement, and the rock, as delivered, you believe has material misrepresentations or is, is materially inaccurate. There's this wonderful thing called management response. Right? And I've had to do this one time, it wasn't for a, a, a QSA, it was for an internal audit. Where you can write essentially your counter brief as to what you think happened, why you think it is that way, and bundle them both together as they begin their way up to your audit committee. 
the challenge with doing that is more than likely someone is going to lose their job. Right? Yeah, I still work there. <laughs> so, um, but that's really that's really a last resort. And if you have to do that, that means you failed way early in the process. More than likely. So, when it's all said and done. So when it's all said and done, it's, it, it, the, whole, the whole point of this kind of assessment, an audit, whatever, whatever you want to call these sorts of activities, it's internal, external, regulatory. Um, for example, in my current job, we have several of our very large payers, um, like a like Blue Cross Blue Shield, they have the right to audit us within certain functions. Um, we get the report and we use it. Don't. Don't go into fear of bunker mode, right? We've all seen the old when Hitler finds out about whatever. Don't yeah. let that be you, right? The, the, the key is the CISO is to realize they're, they're telling you some truth. It may be it's truth from a, from a different angle or a different perspective than you normally look at your world, but it's really keyly important. You take that in, take what's valid, and use it to help you know, shift your program. Now, if you're doing stuff really well and you get a stellar rock, yay, you buy your team beers, right? Uh, if you didn't, you know, you use that as a rally point to either stop project A to go work on remediation project B or, or whatever you have to, right? Just get some value out of it. Don't just file it away. Don't just say that this QSA sucked. We're going to replace it next year. Just don't do that. <laughs> so, this is contact info for... Thank